Okay, that was kind of loud, but I might be a little loud. I apologize. So if he needs to turn me down, that's okay. Um, before I start, <clears throat> let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here today to this church. We thank you that you are present here. We thank you for Trish's story, for the kids, and also for the adults, because it made me laugh. And it just reminded us of your love and how love is so important and so key. And as we read these verses, and your Holy Spirit is present here today, let your Holy Spirit shine out of me. Let your words in the Bible speak truth to our hearts and our minds. Let us learn about how in family and relationships and in our workplaces and in our church that you bind us together unified in your love. We thank you for that. We praise you. I ask your words to be on my lips today. In your name, amen. <clears throat> so during a rehearsal for her wedding, a nervous bride was having a really difficult time remembering all the details. She was starting to freak out a little bit. But her kind pastor took her aside at the end of the rehearsal night, and she, he said to her, when you enter the church tomorrow, you're going to be walking down the same aisle you've walked down many times before. You've been here so often. You've practiced this. You've, you've done it before. So first of all, when you walk in the door, concentrate on the aisle. Just focus on the aisle. When you're halfway down the aisle, look up at that altar. And then when you get up to the altar, look at the eyes of your groom. Focus on your man who's waiting there for you. So focus on the aisle, then look at the altar, and then lock eyes with your man. That's all you have to do. So this seemed to help a lot. She felt a little bit more at peace. So the day of the wedding, the beautiful but nervous bride walked flawlessly down the aisle. But people were a bit taken aback as they heard her repeating these words during the processional. I'll alter him. I'll alter him. I'll alter him. People kind of thought that was strange. Maybe there were a few women in the audience who were like, oh, yeah, girl, you do that. You know, maybe, maybe they were, were rooting for her. But if that's truly the word she was repeating, we would have some serious concerns about the marriage. But today we're going to look at marriage. We're going to look at some re family relationships. And we are going to mostly look at, in all these relationships, how we can allow Christ to alter us. It's not about the other people in these relationships. It's only about us and how Christ can change us. Because if we're not allowing to ourselves to be changed, he can't change anything about the situation around us. So we're going to be in Colossians 3, um, verses 14 through 17 is where we're going to start. This is the intro to the rest of this, um, the advice in the Bible here. So Colossians 3, starting in 14, says... If you guys want to look it up, I'll give you a few, few minutes, a few seconds. So Colossians 3, starting in verse 14, it says, Beyond all these things put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So this is where I want us to start and look at the, some of the great words here. Love, unity, peace, thanks. Does God want these things in our relationships? Yes, he does. But the amazing part is, in these verses, it's, he's already actually provided the way for us to do this. Look at the two key phrases. It says, we have peace by Christ ruling in our hearts, in verse 15. And in verse 16, it says, with the word of Christ richly dwelling in you. So he already gives us the ways that we can have that love, unity, and peace. And that's with him ruling in us. Otherwise, we will be ruled by our selfishness. And we'll get frustrated by just trying and trying and trying. I'm trying so hard in this relationship. I'm trying so hard at work. Nobody gets it. They're every, everybody's making me mad, but I keep trying. It's about Jesus ruling in us and dwelling in us. It's not about us trying because we will always fail. 
After verse 17, it starts into healthy, God-centered advice for relationships, starting with marriage. Now, I'm focusing probably most of the sermon on marriage. Some of us may not be married, but that's okay because you can still take the qualities and some of this information and apply it to your lives. So if you go back a few verses real quick in Colossians, Colossians 3, verses 12 to 14, you see a lot of um, descriptive words that God wants us to have in our lives. We see compassion, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, humility, love. It sounds like the verses in Galatians 5. If anyone's ever read Galatians 5, 22 and 23, it's the same characteristics. Now, those qualities would be really easy to have if we didn't have a difficult spouse, if we don't, didn't have kids screaming and running around our house, if we didn't have parents telling us what to do, right? And if we didn't have coworkers who were annoying, and if we didn't have church members always breathing down our neck, those would be really easy if we lived on our own, wouldn't it? to be, you know, loving and kind, because I could treat myself well all the time if no one else was around. But God doesn't call us to that, does he? He, but the good thing is, do you guys, has anyone read Galatians 5, 22? Those characteristics are those qualities, the fruit of me working hard. Are all those qualities the, the fruit of my works? No, what are they the fruit of? the Holy Spirit. They are the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So on my own, in difficult situations, I will not have any of those things. They're the fruit of the Spirit. We have to have the Spirit living in us to do these things. And in verse 17, the reason we're doing it, we're not doing it for those people. We're not doing it for our annoying co coworker. We're not doing it for our spouse who's making us angry. Verse 17 says, whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. The way you treat your spouse, the way you treat your kids, the way you treat your coworkers, are you doing it to give Jesus glory? Think about that. I love the analogy my friend Shiri, she used to come to church here, gave me once about the Holy Spirit. The, in the Bible, they used anointing with oil to represent the Holy Spirit. And they would anoint the priests, and they would drip the oil down their head, right? The oil would drip off and go down their bodies. And then if you think about oil, when you touch oil, what happens? What are your hands like? Greasy, right? I mean, you have to wash them really well to get that grease off. If you didn't wash your hands well after you were cooking and having them in oil, everything you touch would be covered with what? Oil. They'd be greasy, right? It'd be oily. So if we think about the Holy Spirit in our lives, when we ask Jesus to come in and the Holy Spirit shine in our lives, his oil is shining through us. So the people we're around most should be the oiliest, shouldn't they? The people we have the most contact with should be the most covered with the Holy Spirit's oil, shouldn't they? Sometimes, unfortunately, our spouses and our kids, they actually get the least amount of the oil because we're around them so much and we're not letting Jesus have all those moments and those difficult times. And that's where we need to go back to him and have him fill us because we will get overwhelmed. And what's the solution? Do you guys remember the story of Jesus with the woman at the well? Well, Jesus knew she was failing at relationships. Jesus knew she was looking to meet her deepest needs with a husband. But you know what kept happening? The man always failed her. Finding a new husband failed her every time. He didn't meet all of her needs. She, same within our lives. Money, success, pleasure, work, those are not going to meet our needs. The first re 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 relationship we're looking at is marriage. But in others, we also first need God to meet our needs through that living water of Jesus. We'll all wake up every morning needing acceptance, identity, security, and purpose. Are you going to go to Jesus first to meet those needs, or are you going to look for another person or something else to meet them? Unfortunately, those things will fail you if they are the ones trying to meet those needs. So I could stop right here. And that could be the end of the sermon. But we're going to go on with these verses and talk about some of this healthy, God-centered advice about relationships. First, Colossians 3.18 talks to wives and husbands. You know, and so does Ephesians 5.21 to 33 has some great advice. You know, it's interesting. Christians and non-Christians alike look at these words and they want to push away from them. They want to say, oh, I don't like that wording. 
oh, I don't like what I'm called to do. But do you guys agree? Well, Colossians 11 says there's no inferiority in Jesus Christ. Colossians 3.11, so once again, it says we are all, there's no distinction, but Christ is in all and he is all. He's not talking about a social ladder. He's not talking about men or women being greater or one inferior to the other. He's talking about a role that we have. Do you guys agree that we all have a different role in our workplace? Do we all agree we have a different role in our house at times, in our families? I mean, I'm a daughter, I'm a wife, I'm a mom, I'm a sister. Those are all different roles. So I have different roles to meet in those areas. It's not about inferiority, the words that Jesus is addressing. He's actually addressing men and women's greatest weaknesses. Do you guys remember at the fall in the Garden of Eden? What was Eve's weakness? What did God have Adam and Eve? He created them to be a partnership, right? But when the serpent comes along, it's Eve and the serpent. Where's Adam? First of all, did Eve go to Adam for advice? Or did Eve have the, I got this. I don't need a man telling me what to do. I got this. I can talk to this serpent. I don't need his opinion or his input. I'm a strong woman. I don't need a man's opinion. Unfortunately, she didn't get advice from her partner God gave her. And where was Adam? Was he off watching TV in the garden? <laughs> was he distracted? Was he passive? Did he not go to his wife and see her talking to this strange serpent? Maybe he saw it and he's like, whatever, and wandered off, and he was passive. I kind of think those are the two weaknesses that men and women in our society have, passive men and women who think they've got it all covered and don't need help. So this is what God addresses, and he's not putting us down or calling either one of us inferior. Remember the words unity and peace. God created marriage as a partnership, working together for common goals. Are you doing this in your marriage? What are your goals? Colossians 3.18 says, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting to this Lord. As is fitting to the, in the Lord. What does this mean? We're not talking slavery. We're not talking inferiority. We're not bowing to him and saying, yes, my Lord, what may I do for you? That is not what it's talking about. The word submitting means my needs second to his. So women, this is for women, right? Right now, so men, don't be pointing at your wife and saying, ha, 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 ha. This is for women. Think about it. Wouldn't the greatest marriage be two servants in love? I'm meeting your needs second to my own. Oh wait, no, I'm meeting your needs second to my own. That would be the best marriage ever and that's what God calls us to be, his servants, doesn't he? Whether in marriage, in parenting, in the workplace. It's not about putting myself in harm's way or going against God's word also. So I wanna say that these verses never should be used in an abusive relationship and people can misuse that. So don't take it that way. Now. Women, I'm going to talk to you real quick. What are some of the four greatest needs of your husband? The four greatest needs of men. So there's this really great pastor out there. His name's Jimmy Evans, and he has a ministry called Marriage Today, and he has some great things. But they list the top four needs of a man in marriage. And that top need, me and my husband have discussed this. I'm like, okay, what do you think? Is this kind of true? And he, he agrees. So I want women to kind of think about this because do we know those four needs of our husband? The first one would be respect. So you can go to Ephesians 5.33. This says this. We're talking respect, which is honor or esteem. This is a key to a man's heart. As a wife or a mother or a daughter, think about your son or your dad. If you are disrespectful for them, your son is not going to grow up with a mom who he loves in the same way. If you're disrespectful to that little boy, even a little boy is looking to be, you know, shown he's a man and that he's going to be, you know, he's loved and respected for what he did. And this is the same with our husbands. We need to be their cheerleaders and encourage and praise them. Do you know that men gravitate to the places where they get the most respect? They run from disrespect. Encourage his plans and ideas. You know, military is based on respect. A man is willing to serve under a commander he knows will always have his back. Stand up for him and never leave him behind. He will go into open fire to earn respect. It's not always in what you say, but how you say it. I know that this is very true with me and my husband, because I'll say something, all of a sudden I'll get this little, 
snarky attitude back when I said something. I realized I probably said that in kind of a tone that was not so nice, or my eye rolling said something a little disrespectful, because I do tend to roll my eyes occasionally. And I, I, you know, learning, learning this is a key. We all, we all have our weaknesses. So those are things to work, learn, on, learn about. So the first would be that respect. The second would be physical intimacy. Ladies, I think we know what we're talking about. Do you make this a priority and do you initiate? If you want him to connect with you in your love language, whether that's quality time or communication, are you connecting with him in his intimate love language? The third one would be companionship. Men want fun and friendship. Women, we need this talking face-to-face -face time to connect. Men need like a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder time. They need you to be their pal and be with them. Is it camping? Is it being in the garage? Is it watching sports together? Is it watching him play sports? Is it watching TV or movies together? Is it outdoor time? Is it games? What is it? What did you do when you were dating? What does your husband love to do? What would he love you to do with him that you keep saying no to, but he wants you to be a part of that shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder time? Remember, women, this may have no conversation. You may just sitting there silently while your guy is doing this, but this may feed his needs. The fourth thing that men need would be their fourth need would be domestic support. This kind of means whatever in your family this means, because some husbands are the cook in the house. They love to cook but they'd love you to do some other things. This is something as a husband and wife you need to talk about. Now, the one I want to say for women, look for reasons to praise your husband. It was funny because this, this pastor, Jimmy Evans, would say, ladies, if you come home and you see that his shirt's buttoned, right? And that shirt, you know, buttoned, it's all lined up. It's not, no, no one button's hanging off. Then, then you could praise him like, honey, you buttoned your shirt so well today. I love that shirt. And, and he said, you're going to see your husband wearing that shirt every day. So it's just finding ways to praise him. And it says also, praise 10 times for every one criticism that you give. And this, this goes for husbands and wives in a marriage. If you're going to criticize someone, and we're going to do it in a nice tone, and we're going to talk about how I feel, make sure you're praising them more than you ever criticize them. And this is a weakness that I know that I have, and I need to pray about that. Now also, think about being a cheerleader. When a team's behind, do cheerleaders go, man, you guys are weak. What's with the defense? They're running all over you. And you know, they, you, they don't say that. They don't say, you guys, you're so weak and wussy right now. They say, defense, defense, right, right? They don't talk about how weak you are. They just, or be aggressive, be aggressive, right? So we're not, we don't tell them you're being weak. You tell them what you need to do, right, in a positive way. So one other thing I want to point out to women who want to get up in arms about the word submission, in Ephesians 5.21, it says, submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. This is something Christian spouses should be modeling daily in their household and then to those outside also. Submission carries the idea of entrusting yourself to the guidance and leadership of another to accomplish a task. And, a, a task. and are we so narrow-minded to think that we don't need anyone else's guidance? including God and our spouse. Let submission and meeting each other's needs above our own be a big part of our Christian walk. Even if, if we let this be a part of our marriage, we can have a wonderful ministry and partnership, and this can be characterized by unity and peace because we'll let go of ourselves and we are going to let God rule our hearts. Yeah, that's right, Heather. Tell those girls what they need to know. Because if you're focusing so much on what you think that your wife needs to know, then you're missing the message that you need to hear. And um, the one thing, whenever um, I got two kids, um, a daughter and a son, and there's always uh, a scuffle that happens sometime during the week, and it's always usually perpetuated by, well, she did this or he did that. And I said, well, you're not responsible for what they do. You're only responsible for what? For what you do, how you react to it. And that's the same thing with us in marriage. It goes for the same for guys and for girls, is that whether you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, it shouldn't be predicated or it shouldn't be based on the fact that they're doing what they should be doing. <laughs> you should be doing what you should be doing regardless of if they're doing what they should be doing. So... 
um, the servant partner, the servant uh, spouse. That's a huge thing. Are you serving your spouse? Are you looking for ways to serve your spouse regardless of if they're serving you? Um, are you just looking for what you think you deserve from them? Or are you looking to give them what you've been given in Christ? So in the Bible, it, it actually, when Heather was talking about submission, it actually, in the Bible, it talks way more about what guys are supposed to do and their quality of the leadership in the household. He talks way more about what we're supposed to do as guys and way less about what women are supposed to do. So take that in for a second. I'm going to say it again. It talks way more about the quality of the leadership that we're supposed to do as men and husbands, way more than it talks about what the women are supposed to do. Why do you think that is? So if we go to Ephesians 5 and turn to verse 25, I'll give you a second to, to turn there. Or to Ephesians 5, verses 25. The responsibility on a man is to love your wives and not be harsh or embittered against them. And in verse 25 it says, Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And then if we skip down to verse 28, it says, So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. So it's pretty easy, like Heather said, it'd be pretty easy for you to love yourself if you were in a vacuum in a bubble and you didn't have anybody else there to distract you. I can, you know, take pretty good care of myself. But when you're called to love your wife just as much as you love yourself, that kind of puts it in perspective. Because for me, it's real easy for me to sacrifice things on a daily basis to get something that I want. Maybe I don't go to lunch with coworkers because I want to save up and get a motorcycle. I can save for years and years, and I can be disciplined as, uh, you know, as all day long, all week, all month, all year long to get something that I want. But will I sacrifice something that I want for something that she wants? Just a silly example, just for me and my brother growing up. We grew up in a family that um, my dad has a, a family business, and we grew up in the family business. The one like, big outlet that we did as a family was we'd go snowmobiling on the weekends. We'd go up, just the four of us, and we'd go out and just get lost out in the powder, just out in Snoqualmie Pass, Stevens Pass. didn't matter where. As long as there was snow, we were there. And one thing that my brother and I always said in the, you know, the naivety of youth, and we were like junior and senior in high school, is that we're never going to get rid of our snowmobiles. We're always going to go sledding. We don't care who we marry. This is always going to be something that we do. And I married a girl that was uh, super active, you know, fun person, sporty, um, taught her how to ride motorcycles. So I'm like, sweet, snowmobiling is going to be a slam dunk. She's going to take in this dream of mine and make it her own. This is going to be us. This is what we're going to do. And then I found out, wait, diabetics. She's a diabetic, and they don't have the best blood flow to their hands and their feet. And when you're out in the snow, that tends to get really, really cold. And it doesn't matter how much those little heat packs you bring with you, or even if the grips are warm, if you stop for lunch and stuff, she gets cold and there's no warming her up. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I was still kind of in the back of my mind thinking, man, I'm never going to get rid of my snowmobile. And I didn't, actually. I kept it till this year. But I didn't ride it. Because being with her and doing things with her and doing things with my family was way more important than the tradition and the goals or whatever that I had in my mind that I thought, this is important to me. She's more important than that. And so we found other things that we can do together. That's what it means. It's that, that's, that's kind of a silly example, but it was something that I thought of, and I thought that was always going to be a part of my life, you know, ever since I was a kid. But that was something that wasn't even really much of an issue for me to give up because I wanted to serve her, and I wanted to meet her needs more than my own. Now, originally, the word husband actually meant like to garden or um, like an image of a gardener who cultivates the soil and keeps the weeds out. Um, as a husband, it's your responsibility to love your wife by holding things together and providing an atmosphere for growth in the home, caring for your wife to help her reach her full potential. When was the last time you woke up in the morning and you're like, oh, I've got so much to do today, but man, the first thing on my list is to help my wife reach her full potential. When did you ever think that? But that's actually what we're called to do as husbands is that we're called 
to create an environment in our marriage, in our house, in our lives together to help her reach her full potential. And I can tell you what, when, when I sold my snowmobile, this is an example, if I, when I sold my snowmobile and I told her, hey, I'm not saying this to make you feel guilty, but I'm saying that you're a priority in my life. I want to get rid of this thing so that we can do something else together and we'll use the money to get into another sport that we can do together. There isn't too many things that you can do to tell your wife you love her. Much more than that. Giving up something of yourself for them. Same thing with your husband. If you can do something, and each marriage it's going to be different, whatever it is that you give up of yourself to help them reach their full potential, that is going to bring you closer and closer together. Now there's, uh, there's another story about a husband that he realized, okay, our marriage is getting kind of rocky. We're getting into a kind of a tough spot here. So he made an appointment with a counselor. And he and his wife go and they see this counselor. And um, the counselor starts talking to him. And the wife just starts unloading about how rough the marriage has been. And he's starting to think, man, why did I do this? And she's talking about it. She's crying and talking about their loveless life together and everything. And, and the counselor has been taking notes. But then he, he stops taking notes and he, acts, he scoots his chair right in front of her. And he takes her hands and he just listens to her. And she's just talking and he's just listening. And then at the end, after she's done talking, he just gets up and gives her a hug. And he turns to the husband and he says, see, that's all she needs. And the husband pulls out his cell phone and he like checks his calendar. He's like, hey, I can bring her by like every Tuesday and Thursday. So you can do this for it. Now, how many men, how many of you guys have actually taken time to give your wife a hug and then to just sit and not be distracted by your phone or anything else, the TV or anything, and you've just sat and listened to her. That's huge. Huge. To put aside everything that distracts you from her and just actually take in what she's going to say. You know, there's times where you think that, wow, she never stops talking. <coughs> but guess what? She probably talks so much because you never listen. And she says the same things like 25 different times in 25 different ways because you don't listen to her. You tune her out. So why don't you tell, take the time to just take the message in once and let her know beyond a shadow of a doubt, I'm taking it in. I'm listening to you. I'm making eye contact with you. I hear you. I'm responding back to you. Guess what? She'd get it all out in probably 15, 20 minutes. You'd have a conversation and you'd be like, wow, that was actually a pretty cool thing. Ephesians 5.25 says to love wives as Christ loves the church and gave himself up for her. This calls men to be loving and willing to die. Okay, as a guy, how many of you, if you saw a kid like kind of stumble off the curb and fall into the street, you'd jump out there in front of a car and try and save that kid? Probably all of us. We, we're wired to really be protectors and to give ourselves up. But we, we do that for anybody. So that doesn't just make it special that, oh, well, I'm her husband, so I do that for her. You do it for anybody. So it's not like it's that big of a deal. For in that perspective, but what about dying to yourself? What about doing things that you wouldn't normally do? For me, it'd be eating Indian food because I hate Indian food. That's something I need to work on. <laughs> yes, I don't give do. that up of myself. Ask my <laughs> wife when the last time was I, we went to Indian food. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so there's one that I need to do, right? Another silly example makes you laugh, but that's something I could give up. And if I went to Indian food, how much would that tell you that I love you, babe? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just saying. Okay, so what are the so Heather talked about the four four needs that uh, a woman has, well, or that a man has. But what about the four needs that a woman has? Now we could ask the ladies, but I'd rather go through this list because it'd probably be quicker. <laughs> so we have to make sure that women the the number one thing, and these are actually in order of priority. The number one thing that a woman needs to feel in a marriage is security. She needs to know that she feels safe. She needs to know that she can tell you anything that's on her heart and that you will not only listen, but you'll actually care for her and you'll try and help her with that. You'll try and protect her from whatever it is that she's scared of. You make sure that her needs are met first. The next thing. Okay, so this is number two, guys, so remember this because this is tough for me too. Physical contact non-sexually. So that doesn't mean pinching or groping or talking, you know, trying to get to the result that you want. It means just being there with her, putting your arm around her, talking with her, making that eye contact. That's huge. That's number two. Number three goes along with that. Open and honest communication. 
So when she asks you, how was your day? Be like, oh, yeah, same old day. You know, she's asking for you to connect with her. So take the time to actually give her a little bit about what happened with your day. You had a customer that was tough. You had an issue that was, uh, you know, it was a mess. Or you had a triumph. Hey, I can't tell you how many times I've come home and been like, man, I really need to share with Heather something good that happened today. And sometimes I share it, sometimes I don't. That's something that you need to do, especially if she asks you for it. If she comes and asks you how your day was, my wife does pretty much every day. Make sure you communicate with her. And leadership, okay? So they're not looking for a guy that's going to come in and be like, this is what we're doing, staying the course, this is my ship and I'm steering it, and you're just along to pull the anchor up. No, she's wanting you to initiate. That's it, plain and simple, initiate. That doesn't mean you're just sitting there and she's like, you know, we really should go to the park with the kids today. Eh, whatever. She's wanting somebody that's going to be like, hey, you know what? It's a great day. Let's go do this. Or, you know what? I was thinking that because um, the kids are doing so well in school, we should do this together as a family. Or, hey, I'm seeing some warning signs here of a problem that maybe we could be uh, getting in front of, taking care of. Just showing initiative. And then together you can work on the solution. But a lot of times it's just identifying, hey, what is it that we need to be working on together? Okay? So, not being passive. So we, we need to be providing security, affection, communication, and leadership. Those are the four things. What, when a man sacrifices for his wife and meets these needs, he'll show love as Jesus did. But how in the world can you do it? Because there's no way that I can every single day provide all four of those main huge things consistently. I can't. Sometimes I'm driving home and somebody really, really torques me. Sometimes I, I've had just a horrible day at work and the last thing I have on my mind is, you know what, I need to develop my wife so she reaches her full potential today. <laughs> I can't do it, right? So I, I have really gotten in the habit of as I'm driving up, up the hill, because I work in Woodenville, as I'm driving up the hill going past the high school, I'm like, Lord, fill me as I get home and I've got my two little minions that are going to mob me as soon as I run in the door and they're going to tackle me and then my wife's going to be there and, and ready to have a break so I'm going to take the kids and go do something so she can relax. I don't feel like doing that, but I need to be filled with Christ because the only way that I can do that is to have Him in me. So that is the thing that I um, would encourage you to do. The responsibility that you have as a person, not just as a husband, not just as a, a father, because maybe you're not either one of those things, but as an individual, as a human being, as a coworker, as a brother, as a, as a sister, as a, as, a, uh, as a daughter or son, as a coworker, any of those roles that you have or more, the responsibility that you have to consistently live a life of Christ is to be consistently getting into Christ every single day. That's the only way that you can truly be filled with Him and that you can actually be giving to others what you've been given. So God calls us to agape love. His love can be seen in 1, uh, 1 Corinthians 13. It's based on commitment. It's not based on emotion. It's not based on romance. It's not based on those feelings that you get. Because like I said, if you were to respond to the people around you in the way that they treat you, wow, that would be hideous. But if you respond to other people in a way that they don't deserve, if you heap those coals of fire on their head, if you give them the things that they don't deserve, but you give it to them anyway, then you're giving them something that um, they can see is not you but Christ. And the same thing in a marriage. A happy marriage does not come naturally because unfortunately we are naturally self-centered, focused on us, and we're prideful. But if we're filled with Jesus, that's the only way we can do it. We can find a peace that comes through Him and it comes into all of our relationships. All of them. So how is your marriage going? How are things? What is it you as a husband or you as a wife need to work on? What is it you see here how you can better, better your marriage? And you know, the other thing is, as Christians, people see how we treat our spouses. They do. When no one's looking, when you think no one's looking, people may be looking. Just, just letting you know. Next in Colossians, 
So that was kind of, you know, we talked a lot about marriage, but there are some other advice to some other people. And the next thing it talks about is parents and kids and those relationships. So we see Colossians, hold on. Um, so the next one, Colossians 3, 3.20, Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so they will not lose heart. Now, it talks about obedience to parents. Of course, this is not blind obedience, especially we as adult children or grown-up children. We need to have respect for our parents. It doesn't mean we blindly obey, particularly if what our parents say goes against God's word. God's word always comes first. I want people to know this. But also, when we're talking about obeying, we're talking about respectfully listening and following. You know what, though? This is going to put parents on task to be consistent in teaching obedience and listening to, and to listen to direction and instruction. How has a kid learned to be obedient unless a parent teaches it? I have to say, consistency is the word they always say um, with, when it comes to teaching kids. It is tough to be consistent. And moms, we get worn down because I know people are like, well, you need to be consistent. It's like, well, you try every day your kid's saying the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over. Teachers too, right? How, at some, day, some days you get broken, right? <laughs> but consistency is huge because we have to teach consistent expectations to our children. We as parents have a great responsibility. It says, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged or lose heart. It's interesting it says fathers because in Paul's day, fathers were, were, the, you know, were the dictator of the family, but they didn't do it in a loving spirit. They didn't spend consistent, quality, loving time with their kids. And, it's, and there's a guy, his name's Brian Bell, who I got a lot of this sermon from, and he lists some things that parents, not just fathers, might do that can be harmful and frustrate your children. The first thing, and unfortunately this tends to be fathers, which I see sometimes, the first thing would be to ignore them. If you, if this creates resentment. They may feel unloved, and they're always looking for someone or something to feel accepted and good enough if you ignore your children. The second thing would be to indulge them. If you give them everything they want, they're just gonna be spoiled, restless children. It does not create a obedient, loving child to be like, oh, but, but, but they want it, and then they're gonna love me if I give them everything they need. That's actually really not true. Discipline and consistency, kids do need boundaries. They need to know where those boundaries are. The, other, the third thing would be if you're insulting them, they're never going to feel good enough. They're always trying to prove themselves to earn praise. And the fourth thing would be to intimidate them with threats or unfair expectations. We must make it easy for our kids to obey. The way we treat them and what we expect from them has a lot to do with their ability and their willingness to behave and to become responsible kids and adults. Consistency is important as kids will learn what behavior is expected and we must keep our promises and say what we mean or else there's that respect out the window. And isn't that true with everyone? This isn't just our kids. This is with our spouses, with our coworkers, with our church members. If you, I remember my dad, I love my dad, but the thing is if someone asked him to do something, his first answer would be no. It'd always be no, regardless. Hey Jim, will you help? Nope. And then a week or two later, he'd think about it, and then he'd call that person, and he'd be like, hey, actually, I'd like to help you with that. And it was like, the person would always be like, thank you so much, versus some of us say yes to everything, don't we? We say yes to everything, and then we get frustrated, we get overwhelmed, we get sick, we get tired, we have too many obligations, and then we call, and we're like, you know what, actually, next week, I can't do that. How does, how does that make people feel? The opposite, frustrated with you, irritated with you. When you ha and same with, with your children. Set expectations you can follow. I've seen so many moms in the grocery store. I will never take you to the store again. Really, mom? You're never, ever going to take that child to the store again. I don't think that's a, a real true you know, comment that you're going to follow through on. Not saying I've never, never done my fair share of those random, you know. So here's a few questions to think about in parenting. Number one, do I believe my children are, my, are not mine, but rather a gift that God has entrusted to me? Am I partnering with God to enable my children to become the men and women he intends them to be? Do they know how excited I am about them? Do they feel like I'm on their side and I make them a priority? Am I living under the leadership of Christ in my life so that my children will have a model to follow? Am I, am I, call, 
Am I calling my children to obedience and providing corrective guidance and discipline that is firm and fair? I am not a marriage and family counselor. If you're struggling with your children and with your, with your marriage in real ways, you may need to find someone to help you in that. But we're talking about Jesus filling you. We're talking about him changing these characters and helping you. But if you need real strong help in these areas, there are people, Christian counselors, who are there to help also. Um, now, at the end of Colossians 3 and into 4, we see the relationship of slaves and masters. Now, by no means is the Bible endorsing slavery. In Paul's day, slavery happened because of military control. One country or city would take over another city because they fought, and then slaves were a huge part of that society. It was not based on racial, like unfortunately in our country, the things that happened with slavery. It was not based on that, but he did still did not endorse it. And the one place in this society society where slaves and masters could be actually treated fairly and talked to was church. So it was the one place they actually could be treated equally. And as the Bible's words reached Christians in the Roman Empire, there was treatment of, of each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. The slave and master relationship started changing. Now this is not exactly like work. Some people may feel they're slaves to their jobs, but there is some good advice here in your workplace. Do, your, do you do your job as it says in verse 23? Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. Do you work as if you're working for Jesus? It calls us to do our best at all times, even when our boss is not around. Do you try to get away with things at work if no one's looking? Do you believe the way you behave at work and the effort you do at your job can be considered a ministry? Because it can be. If you're a boss or a company owner, are you treating each person in your organization justly and fairly, as it says here? God is our boss, and he's the one who is truly in control of, of your company. Place, it in, place your company and your employees in his hands. Do you see your work as a place where you serve God? Whether you're a mom, whether you're in construction, computers, a teacher, a janitor, a manager, a salesperson, a company owner, do you... Do the work daily as if you're doing it to the Lord, not for men. Pray daily for your managers, your coworkers, your employees. Your job and your workplace and your home is not about financial gain, but about relationship with Jesus and the light he desires you to shine wherever you are and in whatever you're doing. And now this comes back to whether you're a husband or a wife, a child or a parent, a coworker, so I love the verses we've already talked about, Colossians 3, 14, 17, and 23. And these all kind of have the same thing, starting with 14. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. How do you put on love on a daily basis? Verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. The only way we can have loving unity is when Christ rules our hearts on a daily basis. Otherwise, once again, it's about us and our selfish ways. We need his unity and his bond. And then verse 23, for the, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. This is about each relationship. Are you committed to repairing your marriage, your family, your workplace? We talked about some key items, but it's all about allowing Christ to rule in these areas so that peace and unity can reign. Let's ask him how he would like to alter us today. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your words of life and hope in the Bible. We thank you that the Holy Spirit is here today. We thank you that your peace can reign in our hearts. We thank you, God, for a spirit of your boldness and not of fear. We thank you that your presence drives out darkness and brings light. And we want that in our families. We want it in our marriages. We want it with our children. We want it with our spouses, our coworkers. We want it with our siblings. God, it says all these things that you want us to have. You want us to be filled with kindness, peacefulness, forgiveness. We need the, your spirit in us to do this. So Jesus, I ask you to fill this congregation with your Holy Spirit. I ask you to dump your oil on their heads so all the people they come in contact with leave the grease of the Holy Spirit behind and that you and you are seen shining your light to this world through each one of us. We love you. In your name, amen.